Thanks for tuning into the Pace Performance Podcast. So this evening, I am delighted to welcome Paul Robinson, James Coppinger, uh, and the Rain Fins a lot. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Hiya. How you doing, Rob? Thank you for giving up your time. A little bit of a different one, I'm guessing, definitely for me, but I'm sure for you three. Uh, like I was saying when we, were, when we were chatting before we pressed record, that done 300 odd episodes of strength and conditioning coaches, fitness coaches, sports scientists, and I'll kind of lump them together today in discussing how these practitioners serve the player and what they think is best for the player and doing all they can to win a Saturday by helping through the week. But I think the thing that gets missed often is that actually asking the player what they need and what how they think about the methods that are been put into practice through the week to help them win on a Saturday because it's not the practitioner that's winning on a Saturday, it's the it's the player. So the ideal thing for me, which is what is has is, is come today, is various different, uh, so three different players from various different, uh, with various different experiences at various different levels. So I really appreciate you three coming on and having a chat. But I'll just come to you first, Paul, if you don't mind. So yeah. you've made a transition from a player into a coach which it, which have been interesting little chat as well as because um, the, the two guys are go, potentially going through that in, in a year or two. Um, what value do you think of? Might be interesting. What value did you did you think as a player the strength and conditioning fitness coach guy gave, and has that changed as you've transitioned into your coaching role? Yeah, I I valued them very highly throughout my career. Um, I felt they prolonged it. Um, if I'm being honest, obviously I played till I was 39. So the different years with working with different fitness coaches, strength conditioning and, and uh, sports scientists, I always wanted to learn something new and I always wanted my body to be, I wanted it to be 100% going into a game at the weekend. That's how I wanted to feel. Um, but it worked both ways with me. So I'd always have that interaction with, with, with all three of them or if it was just two um, and make sure that they knew what I also wanted as a player and I knew my own body. They didn't know my body. So if I had an ache and a pain after a game on a Saturday, playing at 38, they understood that and knew that I just had to have a downtime in the gym and, and maybe do like a, a different workout compared to the other lads who would go out on the football pitch and, and do a, a little bit of a, a five-a-side session or so. So I felt that it prolonged my career, yeah, learning the different variations and, and working with different different people over the years, yeah. So I, I helped, it, it helped me massively, definitely. Do you feel that other players may, didn't, you clearly have the confidence to go to them and say this is how I'm feeling therefore I think I should do this can know my body was that, yeah. that, just, that just come with experience or had you always been like that through your career no I, I, obviously I, I think you, you have to put your mark down as well as a player because you you know your own body that that person can't tell you how you're feeling or what you need to do you need to tell them right I'm feeling a bit stiff in this certain part of my area so can I do something different I can still do a different exercise even though I'm in the gym working with the lads um, am I eating properly as well? So you'd go to them, right, I was eating this last time and you were, you were drinking it, but I'm not too sure if I want to drink that because it's, it's not making me feel the best. So you as a person, you've got, to, you've got to put your own stamp on it as well and you've got to demand off them of, of what they're expecting from you. Did you, I'm guessing when you started, there was no sports scientist? No. Yeah. So what, what was no, the... Just, what? Me, 1950, that was, like we had our own... Uh, <laughs> Assistant, assistant manager used to warm us up at the time. No, it's like you say, the game's just gone mad, isn't it? I mean, when you look at it now, the amount of staff that you have working at a club, um, the, the the all these people that want to have a say, it can sometimes be, I can see why players get so confused. And it, 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 sometimes it's too much. It is too much. Just, just do the basics of what individual player needs. Leave the player to do what they need to do. And then if they want to ask or they want to add on and do extras, then... That's what they're there for then. They're there then to do a different program for them or to eat differently, drink drink another drink that they're not happy with. Um, and obviously fitness-wise, if you're not in the team, then you want to top yourself up and keep yourself fit just in case you're needed at that time when the manager wants you. So, yeah, the game changed massively over the years. I mean, we, we never even, when we were growing up as kids, we these names were never even mentioned. It was just the assistant manager would warm you up and do everything. <laughs> and the physios, the physios would actually do the gym sessions. So you would do the physio sessions with the gym, um, with sorry, the gym sessions with the physios. That's how that's how it was. Mm-hmm. Cops, just coming to you. What was that like for you? I know, I guess when you joined Donny, there was there was no one there in terms of this like a strength and conditioning fitness guy. What was that transition like when? Well, it was Ross who came in. How did you take to that? 
Yeah, I think for me at Newcastle, sort of in 1998, there was um, a sports scientist there, Paul Winsper. Um, and it, it was almost like brand new then. A lot of the senior pros, Alan Shearer, uh, Rob Lee, Gary Speed, I, I don't think bought into it as much as, as what, what, what people do now. I think um, it was almost like, I'm not sure about this guy. And it's, it's exactly the same with me. Like, I feel like as the longer you go in your career, like Paul said, when I was younger, there was nothing like this whatsoever. So I had to condition my body. Um, I've almost uncon unconsciously conditioned my body by doing certain things. And that's why I feel like I've got to 39 with very, very little injury um, and been able to play so many games because when I was younger, I just, I was, and I've had this conversation with people and some people agree, some people don't, but um, it's almost like it's, it's happened organically. Um, and I think, like Paul said, again, depending on the individual, I think you have to you have to look at the individual first. There's certain things that our sports scientists do now that I, I, I just can't physically do. I don't feel like it's going to benefit me because I've already been conditioned to play and, and, and train in a certain way. So if I start doing something different at 35, 36, it, it's, it's totally, totally different to me and brand new. So I think when I first joined Doncaster, go back to your question, I think when Ross came in, again, it, it's, are we going to be able to buy into this? Like, is this guy doing something with the older group? I think there's more chance of the younger lads buying into it. I see the young lads from academies like Arsenal, Man City come in and some of the stuff they do in the gym is unbelievable. Um, it's something that I, I physically can't do at my age. And I just I look, look at them and I think that's that's the way they've been brought up, probably through 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way through the academy. And that's why it's so good for them now. Do you think, given how you had to be in tune with your body, because there was no one there to advise, do you think that can potentially lack now that they're getting told to do certain things and they're never really, or maybe struggle to have that, relationship with the body where they actually know what they want because they're always looking for someone else yeah I, I agree totally I think I think that not just in sports science I think in football in general I think there were so many players gone by that developed their own identity in the way they played in the way they were when they had the ball um the likes of Berbatov uh Sheringham people that I look at and think Robbie Keane people that just like organically had the talent. It's the same with sports science. I think there's so many people that are so textbook. Um, and, I, and I think that that's just the way it's gone. I think I think it is, there is pros and there is cons to it, but there's no getting away from that that's the way it is. And, and I think it's always at the, 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 the top lead it. So the Premier League, the big clubs lead it, and then the, the clubs lower down sort of follow on years after, I think. Just coming to you, Remain, on that on that same question. What's your experience been like of fitness coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, sports science? Um, so when I started in France uh, Academy, th th there was actually um, a sports scientist, but it was really different than what it is now. Uh, it was really focused on the conditioning, like being able to run um, a lot uh, at a high speed, but there was not not much strength training, um, so I, I could see through the years, and especially when I came over to England, um, the job was different. It was really the focus was so much more on on the strength. So I could see um, that the transition was really the job was completely different uh, from what I could see. I didn't have a lot of clubs in France. But the, when I crossed over, uh, I could see that in England, uh, the job was was seen differently by the players as well. Um, maybe sometimes the players in England, I thought, were not listening uh, and not giving too much credit to the fitness coach compared to what it was in France, uh, where it was really um, not an assistant to the coach, but to the manager, but really yeah, if you don't do what the, the fitness coach uh, tells you to do, you're in trouble. Uh, and and that's what when I first arrived in England, 
it was not that much. It was a bit, players could take some liberties, but through the years now, um, even in England, the fitness coach has a big, big say in, uh, in everything, uh, in all the sessions, uh, how long on the pitch, uh, how many strength sessions, how many power sessions. And it's like it became more important through the years because now it's, it's like the fitness coach could jump onto the session and tell the manager, well, it's too long now. They, they need to, go, to get in. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, the importance of, of the fitness coach uh, is, is really uh, massive compared to what I, what I can compare to 15 years ago, 15, 18 years ago, yeah. We'll come back onto that in a sec about the influence of the sports scientist. Like you say, people jumping in with stopwatches and saying enough, mm. so that influence and power. But just coming back to the, the strength training, was that a big culture shock for you that in England we had more of a an emphasis on the strength and the gym side of things rather than in France where it was more conditional yeah. pitch? Yeah, it was really... Um, all we did was core, a lot of core and running. Uh, when I came in uh, in England, it was... I could see the intensity, the the power of um, uh, of the players, and I was like, "Whoa, um, I need to work on that." And uh, I was lucky uh, to, to to have some help, um, and I got I got bigger in uh, in a few months, and it just makes sense after that. Yeah, the fitness coach was here for that, um, and I, I was thinking, if you don't get that help. Or if you have no one to to ask, I don't know what uh, what, what I could have achieved uh, because maybe after a few months uh, it would uh, not have worked, and I just go back to France. So I was lucky to have uh, David Richardson um, at Dagenham and Redbridge was very a small club, but he really took uh, took care of me and he tuned he tuned me like a yeah a mechanic uh, and uh, and helped me to be. Uh, yeah, the League Two at the time already. Cops, just coming back to you on the strength training, on the strength training side of things, because that was where we had a little chat based on a, a bit of a Twitter thread on the uh, on the Henri comment that he would basically not do any strength training because he found it better that he would spend that time on the pitch. What's what was your what's your thoughts on on strength training as a as, as a modality to in, in improve performance? Yeah, so I've never done any strength training um, throughout my 22 years as a professional. Um, and I'm not saying that's 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 right, but for me personally, it's... And I, and, I, and I always sort of wonder whether if I had, I might have been able to play higher or um, I like to say longevity, but I've had quite a long, a long career. So I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like by being on the training pitch and by playing games that sort of conditions my legs my body um better than any sort of gym program i can understand when people are injured and um they sort of want to do certain things to to strengthen their injuries or to strengthen their legs in certain departments but for me that's never been that's never been the case. I've never been at a long-term injury where I've, I've been in the gym for, for longer than two months, I don't think. So it's it's a difficult one for me. But when I saw that, I've had this conversation with a lot of the lads that I see in the gym doing doing things in the gym for the sake of doing it. I don't think it's ever specific work. I don't say it's ever, but a lot of the time they're in the gym and they're doing things. I'm thinking, like, why are you actually doing that? Like, what is the reason behind Because I, I, I've always been the type of person that needs to... F- needs to find out the reason why I'm doing something. If, I'm, if somebody tells me to do something, I want to know why I'm doing it. Is it going to, is it going to help me or am I doing it just for the sake of it? Um, and I think sometimes that was the case or has been the case. Because there's an hour in the, in the diary to go in the gym, therefore it's going to be used in the gym and maybe don't see the transference from what happens in that off-field environment to the field. Is that what you mean? Okay. Yeah, and I think as well, because you can't see the benefit in terms of like when you're doing it, you can't actually see see it and and sort of get hold of it. I think that for me as well is something that I struggled I struggle with. Um, and maybe, like I said, if if I had had an injury or I, if I had 
um, had to be in the gym or if, if somebody had pulled me aside and said, you need to work on this when I was younger and I did it and I, and I, I improved or I saw the benefit, then I, I might have had a, have a different mindset on it. But for me personally, I've never, ever been in the gym and worked on any, any sort of strength and conditioning. Um, I do a lot of stretching. I am I do a lot of yoga. Um, I'm big on sort of soft tissue work. Um, ever since I was 19, all the way up until 39, now I do, I do do that, and I'm big on that. Um, but as far as strength and conditioning, I mean, a lot of that I've never ever done. Do you think that was partly because you're more of a technical player rather than with the physicality not being quite as important as maybe a different position? I, th I think so, and I think I've I've seen people who have a certain shaped body or their bodies a certain way and they they build it up and build it up and they either, they've either got top heavy and the legs haven't and then they've ended up with big bad injuries and they can't move on the pitch or the other way around like i feel like i've probably stayed the same weight throughout my whole career um and i feel like that play that's played a big part in me not having injuries and being able to be so consistent in in playing so many games um so i feel like yeah i think it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one because again if i hadn't had the longevity and i hadn't played so many games then i might have a different sort of take on it how was it sold to you paul in the first instance when the club were buying up gym equipment and getting scheduled that was actually scheduled in the calendar for for strength training and that was that was part of the routine. How was that sold to you? Because I think one thing that always comes up in these chats with sports scientists and fitness coaches is education to the player. Mm. So they do pre what COPS hasn't done along the, along the way is actually see the benefit and actually have be maybe educated on the, on the benefit of it. Um, then it's up to the player to you know make the call. How was that sold to you in the first instance? It's sold to me like um, with how they how they how they want the plan to look. So the plan would look. So for instance, pre seasons mainly your gym based stuff with what you do anyway. Also with including the football work in that. But then that doesn't go on throughout the season. Throughout the season, it's then it's down to the individual programs of whether you want to be in the gym or whether you want to stay outside and do extra. Like cops touched on there is how many footballers nowadays do you see the players that want to get in the gym straight after a session? instead of, oh, I need to work on this a little bit more outside, where I'm, I'm getting used to my game, improving, 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 instead of, yeah, I want to look bigger, I want to look stronger for no apparent reason. I never found that any interest in me whatsoever. I just found that I needed to work really hard on my game to stay to the best of my ability and, to, and the, uh, play at the highest level. And then the stuff that I needed to do in the gym, I knew I needed to do in the gym, but it was my own programme. It wasn't like anyone else's. I wouldn't be doing silly weights like a, a younger lad's doing because I knew my body wouldn't cope with it. So I would do what I felt was right for my body and what, what I would cope with. And that was a lot of strength and, and core, um, just fine balance in my, uh, my balance, in, in doing certain aerobic stuff in the gym that I felt that I needed playing at fullback with clever movement of wingers. So I was working parts of my body that I knew I needed to work on where I could turn quickly and and mark quick wingers all the time. So that was that was my main focus on gym. But yeah, they they're good at they're good at presenting it. I give it to them. They do present it a, a lot and sell it to you. But I understand that, and it is it's beneficial to a lot of players and how their careers can prolong and how they can go on. But you get to a certain age and you can't you can't do all that stuff. Um, that's that's for me anyway. Looking at that, you you can't do the heavier stuff with what younger kids are doing. You have to fine tune your own program. And you have to stick to that throughout your career and know what, like Cox said there, he's done it throughout his career and he's never changed it. And look, he's still playing 39. So there's an example there of, of, a, of a professional in, in the job that he does. But that shouldn't be for everyone. Everyone's different. Do and I think, think as well, sorry, oh, sorry, Rob. Go I, think, on, I think on. there, no, it's so easy to mix that up with not wanting to go in the gym and being lazy or mm. you're not doing you're mm. not doing enough or you should do more like and i found that over the last three four years of my career is that i see people in the gym and i look and i think should i be doing that and there's a time in your career where other things become more important like recovery like stretching like soft tissue work um and, it, and it's 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 just as hard to do that than it is to actually do the weights and the strength and conditioning because 
you, you almost feel under pressure to sort of conform to what everybody else is doing. Um, so again, in, in my opinion, I think it's important that, you, like Paul said, you do what you feel is right for you as an individual. That's interesting. Yeah, what, what's, what's your take on that, on that Romain? Yeah, I, I, as they say, it's very, so individual. It's um, so I think when you when you're young, yeah, you need some some guidance, some people to 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 let you know what you need, what you should, what you normally need. But you you know your body uh, better than any anyone else, and um, I think as Cops says, um, it's important not to follow uh, people just to follow it. If uh, if you really feel that you, you need a rest or you need some soft tissue work, but everybody everybody else is doing some weight, so we, the manager might think that oh, it doesn't work to work out. And no, recovery is such an important part as well. So I think the key uh, the key is the player, always the player. So if a player is honest with himself, um, he, he should really... Or be asking for for more for more power if he, if he feels he needs power or more core because he, he doesn't feel balanced enough or I think this is the player with the the key uh, of his own uh, shape and how he feels but um, I guess you you need some experience to to do that so how do you deal with uh, a young player it has to be different uh, to how you deal with a more experienced but even a young player, you need, he needs to have his say on um, on what what he feels. Just going back to one of your previous points about the sports scientists running over the stopwatch and saying, "Kind of cut the session or cut the session for X person or Y person." That's I'm guessing that's probably happened to all all of you here. Which which definitely I think the perception it gives a bad perception of, of sports science. In, in that regard, because of the, the smiles on your face, Paul, and that, how that may be taken. But Remain, do, do you think sports scientists have sometimes in clubs got too much power? That they are relying on a lot for maybe things that would be traditionally in the hands of the coach? Well, uh, if, if it happens, it's only the, the, the manager's fault, because uh, at the end, yeah, he must, uh, he must have his say and uh, final final say. But it's all about numbers. Um, so they, they will see that all oh, the loading is uh, is done so many K, so many high, high intensity uh, running. So he played two games last week. So it's all very just numbers. And, and sometimes you feel like you can do more and sometimes you will do less and you, you still need a rest. So if the player says, no, I want to carry on, uh, I feel good, uh, I want to work a bit more. But if, if someone drags you out of the pitch, uh, it's, you know, the, the same, that the player should be really at the, at the, at the center of the, uh, of the, yeah, of the decision. Uh, because otherwise it's going to be just numbers and numbers only. Uh, and you don't, you don't take uh, in consideration enough the, the how you really feel, and um, I think then you, it's like coaching or dealing with robots. Uh, and I think that uh, sometimes it tends to be a bit too much at that, the, the sports science, um, too much numbers. Uh, it, I know there is the word science in there, but you know it's. Uh, I think there is a lot of. Uh, human skill that has to be put in a job. Just coming to you, Paul, there's, there's a common talking point amongst sports scientists and especially looking at the, maybe the younger age who are, who are coming through now and be 21, 22, 23, they maybe don't possess that, that human, mm. not good, with, they're, they're more, more comfortable with the computer and the numbers, as Romain says. Is that something that you see, not not to looking at obviously your place of work, but just generally, is that something that you think's missing? I, I tend to go deaf when they tell me what time is on the whistle, and like you've got to blow your whistle. So I sort of I go deaf in that ear that they're on that side. I just I just think you have to judge the session itself. So if you can see the sessions flowing and the lads are having fun, then you keep it going a little bit longer, and then and then whatever session you're doing next is a fine balance. 
I think you've got to work out your plan of session or what you're doing. And if you feel that the next session's not going to be beneficial going longer, then you can bring that down then, that one. But if you're getting a real intense session where you know that all the lads are loving it and it's and it's a real good intensity, it's a good tempo, you play a little bit longer because you know that they're loving that session. And then I'll compensate for the next one. Okay, that one's not too intense. So we'll bring it down a little bit just so their legs are getting back to where we want them, et cetera, et cetera. But, but yeah, I mean, numbers to me are numbers. Um, as a player, you just wanted to play football. You wanted to, you wanted to run around. You wanted to, to, to love the game, enjoy playing with your mates. So I looked at it, I always used to play, like enjoy the game with 11 of my mates playing on the football, 10 of my mates playing on the football pitch. So they were just numbers for me. I, I never was worried about what I'd run on a Saturday or how far I'd run because I'd do that every game. So every game is a different game. You wouldn't do so much running. And so say, for instance, you're playing against a winger who's going to be constantly at you. I'd do more, more running because I'm constantly with him. But if I'm not playing against a winger, then I know that I've got a freer pathway in front of me and I won't do as much running. So you, you gauge you gauge yourself and like Romain said there as well, it's the player themselves know their body. They know if they're, they can cheat in training sometimes so they can come off it a little bit. So they can come away from that intensity and hide a little bit more. But we notice, I see it. So I'll see that he's hiding, but then he'll do extra in the next session because I've seen that he's hid before. So we'll always find the balance. You've got to find the right balance for it. But yeah. I don't see the point sometimes in times. I just think you've got to let the sessions flow and let the lads enjoy it as much as they can. Just on, on the numbers side of things, how much, I know you mentioned it there a little bit, but how much input does the numbers have on how you go about things and I suppose shape your philosophy in, in how you go about things actually as a coach? Do you Are you happy to take all that on board, but you, are you cherry pick? What, how, how, does, how does it influence you? Well, yeah, you can, you can, you can cherry pick the numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great stats to have in front of you because you know you, you know the players that are cheating and you know the players that are running to the max. So there's no hiding place. The players can't they can't hide from that. So if a player is underperforming or he's under he's not running to the levels that the other lads are running, there might be something wrong with him. So you'll have a chat with him and say, "Is everything okay? Look, you were a bit down yesterday on on what you've been doing. Is everything so? You, man, management, you've got to." Them numbers, you've, you've got to also have good management skills in asking why them people are maybe not reaching numbers of what they're usually reaching, and there'll be a reason for it. There yeah. will be a reason for it. Yeah, so later fine. You, yeah. you yeah, have sorry, to be cautious. Really. Yeah, that's fine, mate. You have to be cautious in what you're doing. It's, it's about man management as well. It's You've got to be clever in what you do because that player might be feeling sore, but he's not said anything because he just wants to train. So then when you pull him after, he might say, I was a little bit tight in my hamstring, but I didn't want to tell you because I wanted to train. Whereas you'd rather him tell you. So you know then that you can you can taper their training a little bit to come down off it. And that's communication, communication skills and and the trust as well. You've got to have trust between each other and you and respect. They're massive in football. All of them are all massive in football. So so numbers, yeah, I do look at the numbers, but if a player says he's fine, he wants to play, then brilliant. I want my players to. I want my players to want to play. I want them to enjoy their football as much as they can. Were you going to jump in there, Romain? Yeah, no, I was uh, completely agreeing that with the point that Robo says that it's you know the numbers you can tell you can make them say a lot of things, but I think you have to first be, if you have the numbers, you're the fitness coach. You have all the numbers of the sessions, and you might think and might interpret them, but first I think it's important to go see the players. Say how you feel today. What are you okay? Um, you feel good, and to have the emotion, the feelings of the players first, and then talk about the numbers rather than go and just oh you've done a lot today. You should maybe have a rest, or uh, you feel good. You feel... And then because you put some ideas in uh, in the mind, oh yeah, maybe I feel a bit tired now. Uh, rather than just asking the guys who might be feeling great. Oh, I feel wonderful. Say oh really? Because you have done. It's the most you have done uh, for the last three four weeks. So it's. So it means that you're really on the up rather than putting things in the mind first and then um, I think emotions, feelings of the player first and then you can interpret the numbers based on how he feels also rather than just numbers first and, uh, and interpret them. Coming to you Cops, how's data and I suppose technology affected how you go about things and how, you, how you're managed by the guys at the club? 
Um, yeah, I think again, it can be, it can work both ways. I think going back to when there wasn't any data, like, like Paul said, we were driven by just playing football. We, we, we went and we trained as hard as we could because we wanted to be as, as good as we could. Um, and that, that's the bottom line. Whereas now the younger lads are, are driven by, a lot of them are driven by numbers. So the first thing that we they see on a Monday morning is the numbers up on the, on the board. How many numbers did I hit? What did I hit? What was my, what was my high speed running? And it's like, I, I do get it and I do understand it, but it's not all about that. People, and it can almost work as in people do too much running. You have people trying to get numbers up to impress the manager or the, the sports scientist or whoever it is, where it's like sometimes you actually don't need to do that amount of running. You, you'd be clever and, and be more sort of position specific rather than just running for the sake of running. Um, so I've seen it both ways. I, I think it's really good for somebody like me at my age because it backs up what I'm doing. So if I'm at 39, which I have, have done um, last season, was competing with everybody else in the team, hitting my targets, hitting my numbers. People can't use it then against me and say he's 39 and he's not fit enough. Whereas I go, well, have a look at these, these numbers because I'm running exactly the same amount as a 23, 24 year old in my position and I'm producing as well. So in a way, there's a negative, but there's a positive. And again, it's how you communicate it for me. It's, it's exactly right. Communication, respect, the huge and trust. Um, if you've got all them, then I think the numbers help massively. From a, a fitness coach, sports scientist, s &C coach, coming into a football club, and Paul mentioned it there about knowing football and having the respect and just knowing the culture of football, how do you think, how important do you think that is as a, like I said, a fitness guy coming into a football club that they actually maybe just have spent time around that environment so they know what players are like. They know that some may be, some may happy to hide and doing some certain things and some may not, some may be data driven, some may not. So just knowing that culture, how important do you think that is? Um, so, I think it's I think it's hugely important, but at the same time, I think it's quite warming sometimes to see that naivety from sports scientists that that they they're working across the board. It's not like they they're gravitating to certain individuals because of the hierarchy. It's like we we have sports scientists that that they're, they're the same with every single player, and they do their job and they stick to to what they know. And as a as a player, you understand that that you're going to get the same from him as you're going to get with somebody else. Um, so I think from a sports scientist perspective, from an individual perspective, I think football is a very niche industry. And if you're coming in off from university, not knowing football, and I've seen it where you, they come in and go out because they're just like, oh my God, what is going on here? I'm getting, I'm getting tortured and abused and all the rest of it. And the lads aren't having me or whatever. Um, so... I think it works both ways again, I think. Um, but from a player's perspective, I like I like to see sports scientists that really enjoy their job and really enjoy passing on, like what we start, said at the beginning, the understanding. If they can get across the understanding of why they're doing something, then for me, it's it's, it's huge. Just, just to stay on that point, how would, from your, from your experience, how would you want a sports scientist to impart that knowledge? Because it's not just about been sick with big words to try to impress how much they know what's the best way from your experience that someone's gone about trying to impart that bit of knowledge on on you guys i'll take for for uh, i was at the minute for example he's come in and i was 36 37 and straight away he pulled me to the side and he said look he said i'm not here to to tell you how to suck eggs i'm not here to tell you to do this this and this you, you've had a 15 16 17 your career so anything that you're uncomfortable with and not sure about um come to me i'll explain everything that i'm doing if you don't want to do it that's fine we'll see the manager and we'll speak to him and, and straight away you sort of think that's excellent because um he understands me he's taking his time out to to, to come to me as an individual and i imagine he's done that to a few others as well so i, th I think that's huge again communication i think is the key just going back to you remain what, how, what, what would work best for you, for that education side of things? Well, it's um, first year, it's someone coming into a football club uh, has, to be, has to be clever. 
uh, try to understand how it works, how the players, the group effect can work. So you, because if you come and you know you don't don't study and don't really know how it works, and you get everybody don't give if no one gives you credit, it can be very hard for you uh, and like just look at you and and not listen to you and and you you will never get any good session out of the boys because they just don't 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 trust you and then it can be very complicated uh, I guess for 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 someone new in the football club uh, but then if you see that that person knows his business and 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 relate that because the the most common thing is like how is it gonna help me uh, being better on on the pitch that this is the how am I gonna, gonna make better passes or uh, score a goal um, with with sport and science um, what what what's the benefit of it and uh, then the best one they, they will give you example you know, this kind of exercise it will relate to your position you will do this a bit better you're gonna turn better you're gonna uh, have a better jump uh, you, you will have the, the ability to repeat to repeat uh, sprints then when they can really show you um, what it's gonna what it's going going to bring to the pitch for you then then you, you start to listen but otherwise if, it, if it's just exercises uh, because it's good for that muscle or that muscle uh, if there is no example of what it brings on the pitch uh, it, it's not real for, for for some for some players and and i can understand that if uh, if there is no point relating to the pitch um, you won't get the the players listening just come back to you Paul. On, on that on that rob as well yeah right, just just to touch on that was um oh, they've got to be good characters as well like cops has touched it there you got to understand the group of players that you're going into so you've got to be able to go in there and, and expect some like real good banter from the lads and, and and have that connection if you have a great connection the manager the manager would have done all their preparation before they go in with the team that he's taking and the, they'll all know the players they'll all understand the group that they need to work with and then like cop said as well he's that individuality of going around each person knowing them straight away that you're onto a winner because you're getting the best out of that individual already because you know you want to work with him right i want to work with him and and it's it's a great connection to have you've got to have a great connection and, and i find that they've got to be characters if they've got to understand football they've got to understand the meaning of it and what it's all about the hard times, the, the low times when you're going to get sometimes you're going to get some negative comments off the players, but that's because it's yeah. such an intense game and passion. The passion comes out. You don't mean it. It's not harmful, but it's just having that connection and that and, and that collective togetherness that you need from the group, not only players, but staff as well. As a player and even as, more recently as a coach and not to mention any names here, any, any people that have come in who've not been taken on by the group? Any, any reasons why that potentially happened? Any, any examples of guys that have crashed and burned and any, any, any potential um, reasons why? Just so people can hear and go, well, I, I, don't, I, I, I can't do that because otherwise I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. I think for me, there's been a few that have come in and, and done the opposite of what we've been speaking about is, is treat everybody the same. Um, the likes of myself, five foot eight, sort of 11 stone, lifting the same weights as somebody who's um, a lot bigger, a lot stronger, and not having any understanding or awareness of what effect that's having on me as a, as a player. I mean, I, I, I got injured um, and struggled with my back through, through some, somebody doing that. Um, and again, like I like I go back to me as an individual, I like to know why I'm doing something and, and whether I'm going to get something out of it. Like Romain said, like is this going to help me? Is this going to make me better? And I'm looking at this guy thinking, like I'm lifting the same weights as him, and I'm struggling, and he's absolutely cruising. So where where's the middle ground here? Like how is that going to help me? Um, so I, I always think that that people and sports scientists that just basically take everybody as a group and do one specific thing for every single person. I think it's a no-no, but I also think that football is gravitating away from them sort of people. I mean, at the top level, I know that that won't be the case, but as you come down the levels, 
I think the standard of, of sports scientists and what's available and the knowledge that's available for people now, the free sort of knowledge that people can pick up um, is huge, and not just in sports science, but in everything. So I think the standard is getting a lot, lot better. Do you think players, are, because of this free information that you can jump online and read a journal or jump online and read an article, players are actually getting more educated themselves. They therefore expect more from the person that's looking after them in this area. Yeah, I, I do definitely in every in every context. I think um, it's huge, like you say. And, and players are then talking to other players about their sports scientists, about what they're doing, about their body. Um, but ultimately, it's about what what you're doing at your club and, and who's responsible for. I think as you get older, in fact, I know as you get older, you become more responsible for your body and for for what it needs. I think it's it's a big, big um, attribute in a player is understanding their body. And I think when you're younger, I see it, I see it in the academy players that have come to us, especially one player that's come from Arsenal this season. And some of the stuff he does in the gym, it, it's unbelievable. And he's, what, 18, 19? And I'm thinking, if, if I was doing that at 18 and 19, I honestly don't know where I'd be in terms of, like whether it would make me quicker, stronger, because when I was 18, 19, I struggled physically. Um, so I think, yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that people pick up really, really helps. Paul, just coming to your guys that you work with, are they, in terms of their knowledge and what's, I suppose, what they expect of their sports scientists, do you think that's different to an 18 year old when you were coming through? I think the people I've worked with have been brilliant yeah. because we've always had a, a good relationship where, like Cop said there, I, I, I know my body. So I knew if I was feeling achy, I wasn't doing that. But I wasn't being disrespectful. I'd still be in the gym with the lads because I had to be a leader. I had to be an example to the younger kids that are in there. I'd still be in the gym, but I'd be doing a different exercise. So you've got to be able to, to say to the sports scientist, and they've also got to understand is that, yeah, you're right because... You shouldn't be doing with what he's doing anyway, but let's let's do something different that will work it so it's not being so intense. But I've always had good relationships. I mean, I've worked with some real good fitness coaches over the years, sports scientists uh, like Dave Carolyn, Nick Davis, who's at West Brom, and Andy Johnson, who's now at Shrewsbury with Remain. Um, but they're good characters as well. They've got to be good characters. And you have to understand the players. That's the most important thing for me is, is that you have to have a relationship with the players and an understanding of what their body needs the most and, and also but what's going to help them improve, what's going to make them better and develop and be physically stronger because the kids nowadays, are they, so like Cops has mentioned there, an Arsenal lad, he's never going to go to Doncaster and expect, to, that, that's going to be a culture shock to him and straight away because he's at Arsenal where he's got all the comfy, lovely, lovely, wrap the old cotton ball around yourself. And I'm going to go to Doncaster where, hold up a minute, I've got to, like, I've got to rough myself up a little bit here because this league is tough. Every Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, cold nights, you've got to be mentally ready. Not only physically, you've got to be mentally ready for that division. And some of the kids that go out alone now, they're not cut for it. They're not ready for it because they don't understand. Whereas we understood at a young age, if we weren't ready, that was it. You were out the door. So you, you, had, to, you, had, to, you had to get up and running straight away. And I was lucky enough, I made my debut when I was 17, but... I was around men like Graham Taylor and Kenny Jacket, who's a Portsmouth manager now, and they instilled that toughness into me. Whereas I had to run for a brick wall, no matter what it was, and I didn't have to, I didn't show pain, or otherwise they knew, yeah, you're not ready. Out you go, go on. You're not ready yet. Go back there for a little bit. So I think that that little bit more of a mentality thing as well with the kids now that that, that needs to be instilled into them with doing the gym, but doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it for the right reasons and what it's all about. Yeah, and, 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 and uh, touching on that, sorry, Rob. Like, right. I feel like a lot of a lot of younger players look at the players in the Premier League and the size of them, and it's almost like, do they have to be like that? Uh, like, do I have to be that strong and that powerful to play in the Premier League? Because the majority of the players are like that. And I look at the players like like the lad from Arsenal um, and think. Is it is it is it right for him to be doing what he's doing? Is it having a detrimental effect on him? Is it is it benefiting him or is it is it is it sort of slowing him down? Is it making him uh, less mobile? Like these are the questions that I constantly sort of ask myself, and I think that the fear of the fear of me doing something and it having a negative impact on my 
my performance or my career, I think that's one of the reasons why I've never done anything. Like listening to people talk there and like just thinking out loud, I think that's one of the reasons why why I haven't done anything. So there was a, there was a fear that you'd do something because it'd have a negative effect uh, over a potential advantage from doing it. Yeah, but I, I suppose that. Yeah, I think that's why I have that outlook is because I don't want to be I don't want to be doing something that's going to in, impact my career or the way I run or I always look at I look at Andy Murray so I use Andy Murray I know it's a different sport but I look at Andy Murray for an example and mechanically like he doesn't run he doesn't run properly in my opinion like he's not made that isn't his natural running style he's he's manufactured the way he runs the way he moves and he's he's got I have huge admiration for him. He's one of my favourite sports people of all time. Just because of how hard he's worked and what level he's got up to, but now he's struggling with injury. I feel like because of he's over manufactured his body, and it's sort of starting to sort of fail him. If you like, would that make does that make sense? Yeah, it makes makes absolute sense. Yeah, yeah. And and I always look at me as an individual and think I don't I. I was always fearful of doing that, and I, I would never want to do that. Um, maybe I should have. Maybe I should have. Maybe I would have be, been a bit quicker or uh, stronger. But like you said, uh, position specific. You, sometimes you don't. You don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. Anything to add there, Remain, from your experience? Well, I, I guess yeah. The, I can relate to what Cop says uh, about like being fearful sometimes about you want to improve but then you just think oh i've got it's working not that bad for me so so far and um so the body is uh, you know something you, you, you have to be careful with because you can go down a path of thinking oh it's gonna make me better but then am i am i gonna lose something uh on the way um so that's where the the sports scientists should uh, should come and uh, and gives you giving you some 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 proper advice uh, to to make sure you you do the, the the right choice. I remember when um when I was at, at Brighton, um I took I took some weight uh, because I, I thought that it would benefit me to be bigger. Uh, but I realized after that um, I did it without um, thinking enough of why I was doing it. I was just thinking oh. A lot of players they, they, they look bigger than me uh, in my position, so that would that would benefit me to to be a bit bigger. And in the end, I don't think he did. I think um, I was feeling more tired, uh, and and then so I stopped I stopped doing the work I was doing. And uh, and the year after, uh, I was starting to to really feel at at my peak, uh, and I was uh, two or three kilos lighter. So. Yeah, I think yeah, there is a lot of um, of things where the, the sport science has to be really oriented in the, the right way for you. Do you think that's why players are happier to do strength training when they're injured? Because there's less at stake. There's no Saturday. They've got a, a bit of a time to actually get stuck in without that fear remain. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, I think when there is a down time when you're, when you're injured, then... Uh, it's um it's a good time to really think deeply about your career um think about what you have achieved what you could achieve and um and really me all the injury i had um there was no no muscle injury i never had one uh, just a touch wood now um but it was all joints uh and every time i took the, the break, the mental break, as a, a chance to educate myself uh, about the injury, about uh, what the re- the reason can can be, and uh, try to dig in uh, the sports science side of it, uh, and thinking that's the opportunity to come back better, stronger, and uh, so every time I was exploring the the sports science side of the game. Um, so that's why now I really want to, to, to do that after after my playing career. But I really believe that um, there should be there should be more footballer, ex-footballer, 
going in there because it would give more uh, depth um, to to be football specific mentally as well because uh, how, how to work through throughout a season a career where if you have the chance to to stay at one club with the same same players for a long time and uh, I think there is um, not enough footballers who can then educate other maybe fitness coach uh, going down that path because the, the, the human side of it is so massive uh, that sometimes it's not it's not the case because the fitness coach would not be able to imagine what a pro professional footballer goes through uh, during the year during games so it's uh, I think it's a side that that should be more yeah developed going to you cops because this is a big thing that you're um, a big proponent of and that's the, the psychological side of it and how much that's helped you through your career is there anything that not not taking the role of the psychologist if you have the, the sports scientist but is there anything that the sports scientist could do more on that psychological side within their remit to help the player do you think or do you think it's that's solely the, the job of the sports psych um i think everybody can personally i don't think just sports scientists i think everybody in general needs to understand or try and understand um how to communicate with with people better um i think that's it's huge i think especially in football it is getting better and creating an environment where people feel comfortable and empowering people um to make mistakes and not be fearful of making mistakes because i think gone are the days where you just sort of sort of go through people because they made a mistake or they've given the ball away I just don't think that works anymore I think it's almost like you you have to give them that sort of especially younger players you have to give them that freedom to make mistakes and then help them understand that that by making mistakes they're going to improve um, I think that's huge in, in any psychology uh, any psychology um in any football team i think the successful teams that i've been part of I've been fortunate enough to be involved in sort of three promotions um and every team that i've been involved in we've had that sort of work ethic environment philosophy that regardless of somebody giving the ball away or making a mistake people are going to back them and support them um and i think that's huge from a sports science um i think understanding i know it's been massive on this on this call it's been massive that communication is the key communication how you communicate with every single individual has the biggest bearing on on your results um and and i can speak and i've already said from my personal experience that when it wasn't the case it just it just didn't work for me and i know that speaking to a lot of players and, and seeing what's gone on over 20 years that you need to be valued and you need to feel like you're valued um, to get the best out of people. Just coming to you, Paul, I had a, a guy on, a part of a round table actually on, on youth development. And he was at, at Blackburn. He'd been at Blackburn mm. for quite a number of years and he was head of academy sports science. And he said that the, psych, the psychology is where strength and conditioning was 15 years ago in that people are slowly starting to see the benefits and soon it'll become i mean in the academies i think it probably now is especially for you guys that you have to have that psychological support from a qualified psychologist but how big is the psychology from your point of view in I'm, not big on it, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm not big on the psychology side of stuff okay. myself because okay. of the fact is sometimes that they can fill your head with a load of rubbish and that's just me personally um saying that i mean my wife's a professional acupuncturist so for me, that release of, of getting rid of that energy that I know that's in my body is fulfilling and you get rid of that. Whereas I don't need to tell someone how I'm feeling because I know that's for me to deal with myself. If I know that I need to go and have a chat with someone about something, then I should be able to freely do that like anyone else. If they're struggling and they want help, then they should be able to come to you as a senior pro or as a management staff and say, look, I'm not quite sure on this. What do you reckon? And just have a normal conversation about it. Again, like we, we keep coming around to it. It's, it's communication, massive. You've got to be able to communicate as people and not be able to hold anything in that you feel like you're offending them. 
because you're not. It's it's just the way that you want to the way that you want to get your point across and and communicate. I mean, we probably could all sit in a room and have a great conversation and feel better about ourselves because we've chatted about something that we 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 would never probably talk about, but we felt good because we were open and honest about it. And that's the way it should be. Every football club, you should be it should be open and honest, and and you shouldn't be afraid to hold anything in or or be worried about what what anyone else is thinking about you. That it, it just shouldn't it, you shouldn't be made to feel like that. And mental health in football now is becoming big. It's becoming big. So for me, it's important. And but the psychology side of it, it, I was never big on it. I was never big on it just because of the fact is that they'd say things to me that I already knew. It was already going through my head with what what I was trying to deal with, but yet you're repeating it, and I'm not wanting to talk about it. I'm wanting to I'm wanting to talk about something different that I know that will clear that sort of way. If you know what I mean, I know the way psychologists understand what they they need to do and how they need to do it. But from a personal point of view, I found other things m more beneficial to me with with how I wanted to deal with different scenarios in my career, or like you say. Now I'm not in. Now I'm in coaching. It's different. These kids, they need more. They need more mentoring than being sat in a room talking to them about something that they don't find beneficial. It's there's a bigger picture. There's off the field stuff now that you have to consider as well. There's like home lives. That like is there's all of these little things that you have to, to consider about talking about. So you've got to look at the bigger picture. It's not just football. It's out off the field as well. How do you uh, just go just go sorry just going on that like psych, psychology and, and it's right like it's not for everybody and I think psychology it, there's a little bit of stigma attached to that because for me it's it's more personal development the psychology it's more self development it's more for me personally developing myself like we're talking about sports science getting better and improving the the personal development for me changed my life and my career at 23 um, and we go back to the individual so for paul he's in a good place he doesn't need to talk about certain things and things are going really well for him in that respect but for me it was in it was totally different so i didn't have maybe the support or the i always go back to mind map so every single person's mind is different they were brought up different they were they were conditioned different right from a young age so everybody thinks in a different way there's not one person that thinks in the same way so you get to a certain stage in your life and if you can get help on changing that on and again we go back to understanding if you can understand how to change the way you think to get a different result so it started with me it started thinking dictates how you how you feel how you feel dictates how you act and then how you act determines your results so as soon as i worked that out and as soon as i was given that tool everything everything made sense for me I went back throughout my career and I was like, oh my God, that's why that happened. And that's why that happened. And something happened off the pitch that made me feel like that, which determined me to act like that and then determine my result. So that's that's where I think psychology is, Paul's right, is you can just go round and round and it can be like, it, it becomes sort of, there's a stigma attached to it. And nobody wants to touch it because it just doesn't make sense. Whereas if you, if you go from a personal development point of view, and it's going to help you as an individual. I think there's a total different different thing. I hope that makes sense. Sorry, Paul, I just put it in. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, Cox. It's absolutely fine. That's great. Um, psychology remain. How big a yeah. part has that played in your career or personal development or however you want to? Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I like this word because I think, yeah, psychology sometimes is very formal. You. Mm. Uh, uh, as Robert said, you, you think about the psychologist and you know like confession and uh, and it's I think yeah personal development where if you want to feel better when you realize that you you're not um, you're not providing as much as you could because there is something there is a barrier in your mind and uh, I think so sometimes you don't need a psychologist for that but to have an environment where like a coaching staff or people around you that will have again we're going to say it again human skill who is good at people who are you need people around you who, who are emotionally and uh, psychologically educated so they they can have a feel of what you, you you're going to need as a as a young player as a more experienced player how to what what the the, the player needs or doesn't need is he a talker is he not a talker that does he just needs to, to be provided with some 
confidence uh, in the training just by someone saying that, well, well done, well done, great shot, or oh, you're on fire today. And sometimes that's all someone will need. Or the, another person will need a proper formal chat, uh, chat with, uh, with the manager and uh, have an arm around the shoulder. So it's very individual. And what helped me, for me, it was just me talking to myself in my head when I was uh, without a club uh, in front and I just decided to, to, to cross uh, the channel and, and come. And it's like uh, while I, I crossed the, the, the channel, I, I became a man because then I arrived in England and I had so many things to worry about, to have a roof on my head and uh, find a club to just have a trial. And then I was thinking, oh, I was a professional footballer. I had everything I could, uh, I could dream of and I was not happy because all I was thinking of on the pitch was not to make a mistake. And now um, I was there, I was just like, please just give me one chance. And then I had it and I just, on the pitch, I didn't have this um, fear of just making a mistake. So just pass the ball to him, not make a mistake, don't take any risk. Um, and then I was happy if I didn't make any mistake during the game, but I didn't do anything really good during the game, but it was okay, didn't make any mistake. And then. I arrived, had my chance, and I was thinking, "Wow, I'm gonna take this by with both hands," and I never had this feeling again. And it just, yeah, I crossed the channel, and that that was it. So sometimes it's just a personal development. You have to go through stuff. Um, me, I didn't have help, but I'm sure that if I had, maybe a more understanding, understanding people around me when I was in France coaching, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about the coaching staff I had, maybe they could have you know, helped me uh, before, but then uh, everybody has a, a special you know, path. Uh, but psychology is massive in a way that this is how you're going to feel, that you're going to act uh, in consequence, as uh, Cobb says. So it's massive, but it doesn't mean that you will need a psychologist to to sort it out for for everyone, it's uh, it's very tricky because uh, the body is is hard, not hard to understand, but everybody is different body wise. But the mind is even so much more complicated. But for sure, it's going to be the next field that is is going to be, yeah. It, everybody will want to understand it better and how to have someone performing be between. 95% and 100% of his potential throughout the season and not have any downside uh, because sometimes it's not it's not body related the mind is tired and uh, you can get a physical rest but the mind is still tired and um, so this is a big big part and the, the, the guy who will have a, a very good solution about it it, it would be very wanted I, I think I think that like studying human behavior. So I, I've, I've spent a lot of time doing that and it played a, and a big part in, in sort of helping me, but also understanding other people. So from a sports science perspective, sort of studying how people react to certain situations, their body language, um, because you communicate over 70% of your, through your body language, not the way you talk or how you talk. It, it's, it's unbelievable. So from a, from a sports science perspective to study that and understand, again, go back to mentoring, like Romain said, I think if there was more players that helped younger players on their experiences in, in self-development, in personal development, in, in all these things that have helped them. And if, if certain individuals, cause I'm, I, I'm doing it. I did it with, with, um, a, a youth team, so last week, and I had a few players contact me, um, asking me, they're, they're 17 year old, really, really good ability wise, but asking me, can you help me? Um, what did, can you help me with this? What, what do you think about this? And it's like, it's, it's a perfect scenario for me because in 20 years, I've been through a lot of things, ups and downs, off the field, on the field. And I'm not prof I'm professing to be a psychologist, but I, what I do profess to know is a lot about professional football and how I dealt with it. And if I can help one person or help any individuals, young, young or old with it, then, then that, that works for me. That's something that I, I'm really passionate about. But that's, awesome. that's where, like we said there, cops, sorry, Rob, with the sorry. mentoring's come out, the, the mentoring, there's not enough at football clubs though, is there? 
There's no. not enough ex, there's not enough ex footballers at clubs to guide these kids when they need it because these players have been in the position that these kids are going to be in. They're they're going to make mistakes like we've made. So who's the best person to go and talk to? Is is that person there because he's played the game at the highest level? So I want to I want to tap into his head and I want him to go through everything that I've done wrong and I want to know what I can do to do right. And it, it, it's little things like that. It's not. And I didn't mean any disrespect to psychologists. It's why would I want to talk to someone that's never seen me play football and want to sit me in a room and tell me I should be doing this, I should be doing that. Well, I know what I should be doing, but you've never seen me play. So why are you telling me now to do that? Where I'd look to a senior pro instead and I'd have a chat with them about like, what do you think, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's, big on, that's big for me is that I don't see enough mentors at football clubs for these younger kids to to just to sit down and go through certain scenarios for a game with them. And, and like Cops has done there, it's brilliant. A young kid coming to him to tap into his brain with what he should be doing because Cops has played nearly a thousand games, mate, the way you're carrying on. And it's, but, that's, but that's what these kids should be doing. They should be looking to these players like that and, and getting the information out of them. Yeah, it's modelling excellence. And I don't mean that I'm excellent, but what I mean is it's modelling people that have been there, done it and seen it. Um, mm. instead of sort of just relying on like cross your fingers and hope for the best um, so for me personally it's it's something again that I feel like football should do more it's almost like recycling players back into football and helping players as well as helping younger players it, it, it'll work both ways um, so I, I think I think it's huge I think um, like you said the 17 year old lad that, that spoke to me I'm like there was 20 people on that call how many people do you think contacted me and he was like I don't know and I was like you you contacted me you're the one person that contacted me so you might be feeling like you need to do this this and this but the biggest thing is that you've actually got hold of your own career and you're starting to sort of want to improve in certain areas um, which is massive it, it's so underestimated that somebody at that age to, to grab hold of it and go right I, I'm going to phone this guy and I want to get better I want to know what he's done and how he's done it and if I can get one bit of that that's going to make me better then then I'm looking I'm looking forward to that and that as, as a person not only as a professional football player but as a person that stands them in good stead almost no matter what happens at Donny like whether he's successful in his career or not just the fact that he's been able to do that and he's got the foresight to tap into the likes of you Surely that just stands me in good stead for, for life. That's a great life lesson and thing to, to have. I wish I wish I had that at 17 because it took me until 23 to stop worrying about what people thought of me. And, and I always wanted to be that person that sort of did extra and worked harder. And But I was always afraid of what people would say about me and they'd hammer me because I've been busy or this, that and the other. So for a 17-year-old to go out of his comfort zone and go, actually, I'm going to do a little bit extra. I don't care what anybody thinks of me or what anybody says. It's unbelievable. It, it's such, and, and, and Robbo said it, and, and everybody, or managers and coaches that I see, they all say it, and you need character. You need people with big, strong characters. And they're the ones that last in football and go as far as anybody else. Um, and at 17, to do that, I think he's got a, he's got a good opportunity. If he takes it and he, and he runs with it, um, excellent. And if I can make a difference, then, then, then brilliant. Cool. Is it just one last thing, Paul. I'm going to let you go because I've absolutely killed you. It's the hottest day of the year and you're stuck inside <laughs> and sat in front of a laptop, <laughs> sat in front of a laptop with your earphones in. So just uh, just one last thing, Paul. Is that something that could be done formally? And I'm guessing Cops did that. Did you do that off your own back, Cops? Or was that a club initiative? I'm, I'm, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Like, obviously, I'm not playing like everybody else, but I think people know what I'm about and they've seen me do certain things. And I got contacted. It wasn't Doncaster. It was somebody else. Okay. So I just went, look, I'm happy to do that. And then, like you say, I think I'm an open book. I, I try and help as many people as possible. And, and I genuinely believe if I can help one person, then it all makes it worthwhile for me because I've been in some dark places and I've been at rock bottom and I built myself right up to, to almost getting into the Premier League again from starting in the Premier League. So um, I do understand and relate to a lot of things that people are going through. Just one last thing, Paul, the mentorship thing. Is that something that clubs could take on themselves to do and make, yeah, of course. make formal? Yeah. 
Yeah, of course not. I believe that there's there's players that are coming to the end of their careers now. And we've seen, obviously, some players don't want to retire at, at 33, 34. They still feel that. But if, but if you're laying it out to them, look, we'd really like you to do this role at the football club, then I'm sure the player would think about it 100%. Because it's, it's an important role in life. I think educating these young kids now, they, these young kids need edu- education more than what we did when we were growing up. Because it's totally changed now, the game. You've got social media, the, the, the kids are all involved in. They've got the PlayStations to like three, four in the morning. There's all different other scenarios that we never had growing up as kids. We just had mobile phones and on the streets of our mates playing football till about nine, ten o'clock at night. That was that was how we grew up. Now there's a, it's a bigger world out there for them. So there's so much more for them that they need to be educated about. So I just think it's massive. I think it's massive that... There's people at football clubs who can help these kids understand what professional football's what it's all about. Because rejection, how are these kids going to cope with rejection? If they've not made it at one club, you're telling these kids that they're not getting anything at that club. You now think, you put that seed of thought in that kid's head of, I'm no good. Jeez, but he is good, but unfortunately, he's just not made it at this club because of the players that are maybe in front of him. So you now will go out of your way to try and help that kid get another club and understand you are a good player, but maybe you just need to drop down to this level to make yourself realise how good you are and then prove them people wrong that let you go. So there's always there's always the, the great mentoring that players that have done that and seen it and been through everything, they can help those kids to, to understand it. That it's not it's not you've not failed. That's just that you've just you've missed out of this club. There's another great opportunity for you there. So go and prove yourself there. Go and get the games and then come up again and show everyone what you're all about. And that is, it's just proving people wrong. It's having that mentality. So I think mentors are massive in football. I think there needs to be more of them. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, I'm going to let you all go. But thank you very much for coming on. Sorry to take up most of your evening, on the, like I say, on the highest day of the year. Stop so apologising. Get yourself <laughs> outside and do some that. But no, thanks for that. Really appreciate it. But stick around. And uh, we'll have a little chat afterwards, but really appreciate you uh, you all coming on. Pleasure, absolutely. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thanks, mate. mate.